Good afternoon, I'm Vashon Brown with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. All the Jamaicans on the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line will spend another night on the cruise liner after the government confirmed moments ago that no one will be disembarking today. Our reporter Dwayne Anderson is on location and now joins us live. Dwayne? Thank you, Vashon. Now, good afternoon to our viewers on Television Jamaica. It's a windy, hot day here at the Falmouth Pier in Trelawney. And I know that there are restrictions in place for safety measures regarding masks, etc. But just for the duration of this presentation, I'm going to remove my mask just for the presentation so that I can breathe properly and speak properly. Now, as you can see behind me, the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line is here in the Falmouth Pier. For many Jamaicans, a cruise line such as this would represent freedom. It would give you the chance to tour the world. But for many Jamaicans, about a thousand of them, it's become something of a prison for the last few weeks. But it is finally here. And these Jamaicans are finally home and they'll be coming home pretty soon. However, there's a bit of bad news for them. I got a communication from Matthew Samuda, a cabinet minister who is one of the persons involved in the planning of the return and quarantine of these citizens. And he outlined that none of these residents will be leaving the ship today. Today is all about planning and execution in terms of logistics to get them off the ship. Yesterday, the prime minister outlined that these persons leaving the ship would do so in batches of 200. So for example, there will be 200 tomorrow, another three days there will be another 300 and so forth and so forth then they'll be taken to the Bahia Principe in St. John where they will stay for the mandatory quarantine. Now what is really happening here at the Palmer Pier right now? Well first of all I can tell you that the reason we're not close to the ship is because there's a ban on media entering the premises so we are really on the outskirts along the shoreline outside the Palmer Pier. Also we've been noticing soldiers our personnel from the passport, uh, immigration and citizens agency keep them going in. Uh, we're also noticing a uh, uh, boat, coast guard, monitoring proceedings, ensuring that everything is safe. There are several persons here also looking out, family members, members of the political directorate. They're here, they're happy that persons are finally home. Uh, we'll be speaking with some of these relatives and residents later. But until then, it's back to fashion in our students. All right. Thank you so much. That, of course, was our reporter, Dwayne Anderson. He is in Falmouth, uh, in Trelawney. And Falmouth's mayor, Colin Ganger, says he's confident that the team on the ground will ensure the smooth return of the Jamaicans on the ship. We have a very good and excellent working relationship with Dr. Dale and her team. And they have been doing an excellent job. They make sure that anything that is done, it can be held to the highest standard. So I have no fear. I have no doubt. They will handle this situation in the best way possible. And the attorney representing over 50 workers on Royal Caribbean's Adventure of the Sea, Jennifer Hosen, is questioning the communication between the government and the Jamaicans aboard the cruise line. She says the uproar over re-entry could have been avoided if the government was more open in communicating its decision. Prime Minister Andrew Holness said crew members disembarking the ship at Falmouth Pier would do so in groups of 200 over a 48 to 72 hour period. Could he have at least have said um, two days ago, Friday, for example, we will allow the ship to dock, but some of you may stay on there for the next five days, which is what, as I said, I had known they would come in on the 18th, but the last of them would possibly leave by about the 23rd. I knew this from the 9th of March. So when the government, could, it, could the government have confirmed, maybe even Friday or Saturday, but the day before the ship arrived, saying, look, we're going to do a testing, we're going to phase it, and... Uh, if you're positive, you'll be deal dealt with one way, and if you're negative, you'll be dealt with another. What was wrong in saying that up to 24 hours before this appeared to be a debacle? Speaking on Power 106 FM's morning agenda program today, the attorney rubbished talks of Royal Caribbean bullying the government to take its citizens. 
we can look and say, well, the cruise line should have waited. There are protocols and there are laws that should follow. But here is the kicker. There are protocols and laws that the Jamaican government should follow. It is called the Constitution of Jamaica. And on this little piece of rock, it is bigger than any law in the world. So even if there is a treaty, even if there is any kind of convention, you and I know that that has to be received into national law for it to even have any effect. And even when it is received here, it can be bigger than the Constitution. It's not a case of the Jamaican government being ready and prepared for whenever it suits them to take them on. I am a Jamaican, and if I come in distress at my country's gates, fly that gate and let me in. In the meantime, the government is in the process of buying equipment to monitor the Jamaican ship workers and others who will be quarantined at home. For example, geofencing will be used to track their locations. But with Jamaica yet to pass legislation for data protection, there are privacy concerns. Prime Minister Andrew Holness explained how the process will work. The protocols around it is that the person's data um, would not be kept. Um, the phone will, the term that they use, will be pinged. That means a signal will be sent to the phone, and then that signal will return the geolocation. So there is no tracking on a consistent or continuous basis of the person's telephone. Uh, but at regular intervals, that phone will be pinged. So there's not much information that will be stored. And even then, we are very reluctant because you know, there can be all kinds of mischief and machinations that will expose the government. So it's something that we, we are looking at, but we're very careful, indeed reluctant, to do. Now up to midday, Jamaica recorded 520 confirmed COVID-19 cases. St. Catherine remains the parish with the highest number of cases, 295. And Kingston and St. Andrew with the second highest, 119 cases. 44 of the cases were imported and 24 were locally transmitted. 204 cases were contacts of confirmed cases, while, 500, while 251 cases are currently under investigations. 131 persons have recovered from the virus so far. Though the country has been reporting a decrease in the number of COVID-19 cases, the health ministry says it will still be equipping the island's health facilities to treat with persons who may be found with symptoms of the virus. In that regard, 10 beds were recently placed in a ward at the Princess Margaret Hospital in St. Thomas. There were also additional changes in infrastructure to protect patients from those suspected of carrying the virus. During a tour of the facility recently, Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton also provided an update on cases in the parish. Currently, the parish has two COVID cases, asymptomatic cases, so the parish is doing well. They have about uh, 50 uh, contact tracers. These are existing public health workers, public health nurses, public health inspectors, community health aides and others. And based on suspected cases, they are deployed to do follow-up. And I think they have been doing a good job to date. The facilities are here. We now take a break on the midday news, but please stay with us. Welcome back. Continuing the news now. With Jamaican students scheduled to begin sitting CXE exams on July 27, the government is in a mad rush to prevent a logistical nightmare. Students who will be sitting the exams are scheduled to go back to school in the second week of June. Minister with Responsibility for Education, Carl Samuda, gave an update on Monday. The question of social distance, um, it can be accommodated quite easily because all the other children are out of school, and it will be quite, quite convenient. We will, we will get through quite well. And we are prepared to subsidize the transportation for the students, especially those who are going to be coming in to write the exams. Um, and going forward, we will look at the whole question of providing transportation for students who find it very difficult to traverse the areas from which they, they come. 
Roughly 75,000 students have been registered to sit exams with the Caribbean Examination Council, CXC. Over 80% of applicants have collected compassionate grants through a remittance company. 90% of applicants in Kingston and St. Andrew have received benefits through Western Union. Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark says the government will now focus on other payouts through its COVID-19 relief fund. Said cash grants are being processed and we have about uh, 26,000 in the pipeline and I'm expecting that payments will be made to the commercial banks uh, this week. The processing of the best cash grants for the uh, companies who have retained employees who earn less than one and a half million dollars a year and we have about uh, just under about 250 of those applications representing over 20,000 employees. Those will be processed uh, or are being processed now and we're having an independent review of that processing and I expect payment to occur in May. And the same holds for the small business grants. Meanwhile, things were more organized at a Western Union in Yala, St. Thomas, as persons received their compassionate grants. Although there were fewer persons, physical distancing rules were still not being followed. One beneficiary, however, had other concerns. Oh, how comes people alone and part, I get food. I have many people who want the food and people who are part alone, I get the food. You understand? Me not working now, me want to work now. You understand? I may have one child, school closed up. Them send out, as I said, they send out tablets to give the school. And we don't see the tablet I give, I give to the student them as yet. They have work to do. And it has worried the student, them it has worried me too. Because when me not working, the father has it hard. Local government minister Desmond McKenzie made it clear that the relaxation of the shutdown measures to allow bars to reopen starting today does not extend to certain nightlife entertainment that may include bars. He said the reopening targets only the 10,000 community bars and taverns on the island. That means sport bars, nightclubs and other establishments that sells alcohol will remain closed as the order stipulated uh, previously. We did a sampling, Island Wide Prime Minister, and based on the sampling that we did, points to 89% of the locations that were sampled are in high gear in making preparations for the reopening. We are expecting full compliance in, in some areas. I know that there are going to be challenges in some areas, especially uh, the size of some of these bars. And some of the concerns that we are getting is about the seating arrangement, Prime Minister, outside of these bars. And these are something that we will take under consideration. We go to news overseas now. U.S. President Donald Trump is again threatening to permanently pull funding from the World Health Organization over COVID-19. Details from the CNN. U.S. President Donald Trump has threatened to permanently freeze funding to the World Health Organization. In a late Monday tweet, Trump said he would make a temporary freeze of funds indefinite if the WHO did not commit to improvements within 30 days. The president suspended U.S. contributions to the WHO last month and accused it of promoting China's, quote, disinformation about the coronavirus outbreak. In a letter attached to Trump's Monday tweet, he told WHO head Dr. Tedros Adhanom the only way forward now was if the WHO could demonstrate independence from China and said his administration had already begun reform discussions with Tedros. Earlier, Trump had said the WHO had done, quote, a very sad job of its handling of the virus. The US contributed more than $400 million to the World Health Organization in 2019, around 15% of the organization's budget. Also on Monday, the WHO said an independent review of the global virus response would begin as soon as possible. Meanwhile, it received further backing and a hefty pledge of $2 billion from China. 
Time now for sports. Former Cricket West Indies president, Jamaican Dave Cameron, has rubbished claims of mismanagement made in an audit report commissioned by current CWI president, Ricky Skerritt. More in this report. Former Cricket West Indies president, Jamaican Dave Cameron, has questioned the findings and credibility of a leaked internal audit report, which was commissioned by his successor, Ricky Skerritt, labeling it as a smear campaign. Cameron, who served as Cricket West Indies president from March 2013, until March 2019, asserted in the story published by ESPN Crickinfo that every single payment, whether to him or otherwise, was approved by the board of directors and or the subcommittees created specifically for the purpose of ensuring independence and transparency. As such, he flatly denied each and every allegation made whether expressly or implicitly against him. Among the problems arising from the audited finances, was a decision taken to promote the corporate secretary to the position of chief operating officer, COO, within the same accounting period as recruiting new CEO Johnny Grave to perform similar tasks. The report estimates that the move squandered over 300,000 US dollars. Crick Info noted that another problem emerged from the reappointment of then coach Richard Pibus. The findings revealed that Pibus was given a new position within the cricket department that was never identified as a key role by the cricket committee. It also claimed that the appointment was not approved by either the HR committee or board in advance of a contract being offered. The CWI contract was worth 280,000 US dollars for a two-year period. The PFK audited report also claimed that Cameron received a 50,000 US dollar honorarium after securing a projected deal from the ICC worth 128 million US dollars for the next eight years. However, Cameron, who says he hasn't seen the report, says the current regime is, quote, bent on covering their incompetence and failure to deliver by desperately trying to shift focus to him with baseless accusations, end quote. And that's the Midday News. I'm Vashon Brown. Join us at 7 for Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, have a good afternoon.